There are loads of climbing tips and tricks videos out there, but sometimes they feel a little vague or that they don't leave you with actionable advice. So in this video, pro climber Dan Bell and I are each going to explain three pieces of advice we actually use all the time. These are actionable tips that have led to some of the largest gains in our climbing abilities, and they'll work for climbers at almost every level. So let's get into it. My number three tip is using deloads for gains. Deload phases are simply short periods of time, usually about a week, in which you decrease the volume and or intensity of your training and allow your body to recover from accumulated fatigue you may have built up. While it's an extremely simple concept, deload phases have been one of my most useful tools for avoiding plateaus, avoiding injuries, getting stronger, and ultimately getting better at climbing. So why are deloads so great? Well, in a perfect world with the perfect training program and perfect body awareness, none of us would absolutely need a deload week. We would all manage our training load perfectly and arrive at each session fully recovered. But in reality, that is a very difficult thing to accomplish. And in fact, sometimes it's virtually impossible when you need to train at ultra high intensities. Fatigue in our muscles, connective tissue mindset, and even nervous system can build up slowly, sometimes without us noticing. In fact, our connective tissue is pretty devoid of any neurological hardware that could provide us with fatigue feedback in the first place. Without this feedback, and without being incredibly attuned to our body's other signals, even conscientious athletes can find themselves plateauing in their training, feeling worn down and unmotivated, or developing an injury. So I've found, with myself and many of my patients, that taking a deload week every four to eight weeks, or whenever I'm feeling particularly run down, is enough time for my body to recover from that accumulated fatigue and come back the following week fresher than ever. It costs little to nothing in terms of lost training time, and in the long run, you'll actually end up stronger than before. My brain works so badly in the mornings. <laughs> it's like prime, prime time for just like losing all of my human words. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> my first tip for you guys today uh, is something that has been really intensely useful to me over the years. And that's just the realization that the biggest insights and gains have been made when I get out of my comfort zone. And I think the thing that really enables that is redefining success and failure in climbing. When I go into a session and I'm expecting to send a lot of things, then if I don't do that, it feels sort of like a failure. I've had an off day, um, you know, like I'm, I'm not in some sense like good enough and it's just a negative experience. But at the same time, when I learn the most is when I work on my weaknesses, when I try things that are a little bit unnatural or awkward feeling and try to make them as sort of like smooth and elegant as possible, or when I try new projects that are in my style but are just way harder than the things that I normally get on. So by sort of shifting my perspective to have really just trying hard be the goal, it frees me to learn from the subtleties of single moves or climbs in grade ranges that one might think beneath them. <laughs> and so I think just, uh, just going in with the plan of bettering yourself has made climbing a lot more fun and generally a lot more productive. A way that I think is fairly easy to put this into practice is just to try every single climb in the gym. Most people who climb sort of, you know, two to four days a week are gonna quickly get through the things in their range at their gym anyways. And so there's plenty of time and opportunity to try to get on harder projects or things that you would normally find yourself avoiding. And there's just a lot to be learned there. The second tip that dramatically affected my climbing progression was using a force gauge. This has allowed me to obtain better data about the strength and health of my fingers before a climbing or training session. I always felt like my fingers took a long time to warm up compared to other climbers. And sometimes it was hard for me to tell when I was really ready to try hard. Now, I simply use a mobile board and a force gauge during my warm-up routine, which lets me see with objective numbers whether my fingers are truly warmed up and ready to pull at my max. The hidden benefit of this is that it also gives me insight into how healthy my fingers are that day. Can I reach normal max strength numbers? In that case, I know my fingers are fully recovered and ready to try hard. Or am I way off my max? In that case, I know I may not be fully recovered, perhaps a bit of fatigue is accumulating, or I may even be headed toward an injury. This has been incredibly useful for removing uncertainty in my training, allowing me to get more out of every session. It's great for rehab too, since it provides objective measurements of progress. Now, you can certainly obtain similar data with methods like measuring how much weight you can hang on a hangboard, but I prefer using the force gauge with these recruitment style poles because it's entirely auto-regulated and less prone to external influences like weighted hangs. 
If you'd like to try a force gauge for yourself, please consider supporting this channel by purchasing through the affiliate links in our web store, which will actually get you $10 off of my favorite force gauge, the Tindec. We've included a less feature packed, but still effective model as well. Before we get into our next tip, we gotta talk about our sponsor of today's video, AG1. So I'm gonna mention a couple of things I like about the product, as well as how I use it. First, I love that AG1 is NSF certified. That way you know what's on the label is what you're actually getting. Second, I actually do enjoy the flavor, especially when mixed with cold water. And, you know, finally, I like starting my day off with a strong foundation of nutrition, kind of sets my intentions for the rest of the day. I use it a lot of times when I'm traveling because the reality is you don't really know what you're gonna be eating while you're traveling, so whether that's going out to have dinner with friends or just camping and not being able to bring the same whole foods you would. But AG1 with their travel packs makes it easy to still get those nutrients you may not otherwise get. I like that it has ingredients like prebiotics, probiotics, plant-based enzymes, and lots of vitamins and minerals. Drinking AG1 helps me proactively support my gut health, which is something I've struggled with in the past from time to time. Go to drinkag1.com forward slash Hoover's Beta to get started on your order. AG1 is going to give the HB fam a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D3 and K2 and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Thanks to AG1 for sponsoring this video. All right, my second tip is to climb at other gyms. You can get this a little bit by climbing outside, but generally the amount of variety is less and the amount of volume that you can get in in a day climbing outdoors is less due to kind of skin damage and things. But I've found that consciously trying to get to other facilities uh, over the years has allowed me to make more friends in more communities, to take advantage of kind of like the, the insights and approaches of other climbers. And also, probably most importantly, to just see how uh, different setting teams imagine climbing. Um, I think that it's paid really big dividends as far as my ability to recognize novel movements, um, to be sort of like imaginative and creative in beta reading, and really just to make me a more capable, well-rounded climber. I think that it's really useful when you're not in like a, a projecting phase to try to get to other gyms at least twice a month, possibly weekly if it's affordable. This will just add a lot of spice and variety to your climbing and I think really accelerate the, the pace of learning. And my number one tip is improving heel hook ability. Not only are certain climbs difficult or impossible if you can't heel hook, but I've noticed that climbers who struggle with heel hooks naturally avoid them whenever possible, which shuts them off to massive beta advantages. In fact, I realized I was that climber because I hardly used them. One day a friend of mine literally said to me, man, you're really bad at heel hooks. This was definitely a wake up call that made me realize I had a huge hole in my beta arsenal. Aside from intentionally practicing hill hooks more frequently, there was one exercise that I found to be particularly useful, especially when I needed to maintain more external rotation during the heel hook, which is almost all the time. This exercise is a simple single leg bridge while in hip external rotation. This accomplishes a few things. One, it helps target the bicep femoris, which is the more active hamstring muscle during an externally rotated heel hook. Two, it provides you with the opportunity to work on glute activation during this movement, which not only helps to get your body up, but also reduces the strain or stress on the knee, which may help prevent knee injuries during heel hooks. In fact, a good indication that you have poor glute activation is that you feel a bit of discomfort in your knee when trying this exercise. Three, and perhaps most importantly, it simply gives you highly specific training on using your heels in an externally rotated position. And you can easily progress it by just adding a tiny bit of weight on your hip as needed. The combination of all those factors helped me significantly progress my heel hook game to the point where I can now tuck my heel into positions I never would have been able to previously and easily lever myself up to the next hold. All right, last tip for the day is to use a timer. <laughs> I don't do this as much myself anymore because I've done it for so many years now, but um, I think it's really critical for two reasons. The first is to avoid rapid firing on projects and to make sure that you take enough rest to minimize fatigue accumulation when your objective is either trying things that are sort of max, uh, maximally difficult or where skill learning is the objective. Conversely, if you're trying to have more of an endurance-based workout or you're working on training work capacity, you want to make sure that your rests are adequately short, that you're accumulating fatigue over the course of the session. That's been really, really useful for me as far as getting consistent workouts and uh, not having some days that are really good and some days that are really bad, not really knowing why. 
The other thing that I find a timer to be useful for is for people who are more actively training. And that's to get a sense of how many things realistically fit in a session. So often you'll see people write training plans and then you go through it and you're like, there's no way you could finish this in less than like four and a half hours, you know? Uh, so what I try to do with that is when I write a training plan, whether it's for myself or for clients, I'll block out how long I expect each session to take or each section of the session to take. And then you can very readily compare that to sort of reality and see how it goes so that you can either trim down or add elements as needed. But additionally, it's so easy to get distracted either with a new set or chatting with friends or get sucked into a cool project at the gym that you inadvertently escape the bounds of your plan. Um, so by having a timer, much like with pacing your attempts, it's very useful to pace the components of your workout so that if you know you're only planning on spending 30 minutes warming up and an hour on projects and then you know another hour on whatever strength training and endurance, you're able to actually get through those instead of <laughs> spending an hour flashing things and kind of like bullshitting around and then not getting through any of the things that you plan to do. So it's not a very exciting tool, but I think it's one that's really, really important. So what is this mystery bonus tip? Well, it's from me, the part of Hooper's Beta you usually don't see because I'm behind the camera. I wanted to give you my most used piece of advice that I've learned from working with Dan and Jason over the years. This might sound like a stupidly simple tip to experienced lifters or climbers out there, but since I had no prior fitness experience when I started climbing, I literally did not know this was a thing and there was no one around to tell me about it. If you're in the same boat, then this tip is for you. Progressive overload basically just means you're able to keep getting better at something over the long term by continually making it more difficult as your body adapts to the stimulus. This concept helped me realize that a lot of exercises I copied from other people in my early climbing days were not intuitive or convenient to progress. I ultimately learned that if I want to use an exercise for strength gains, I must be able to make it harder week in, week out. And if I can't progress a strength training exercise consistently, I'm really not making good use of my time by doing it. So not only did this cause me to literally progress more effectively, it also gave me a useful way to identify which exercises were more useful to me than others in a vast sea of options. For anyone interested in learning more about progressive overload, as well as the science behind muscle building, strength training, nutrition, and much more, I highly recommend the podcast from Stronger by Science. I'll link a specific article in the show notes about progressive overload, but really the entire podcast is worth checking out. Thanks so much to everyone who supports free science-based content on this channel by subscribing, buying t-shirts, purchasing gear through our affiliate links, and just generally sharing the psych. Until next time, train, climb, send, and repeat.